Welcome, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us for part three of Greywater Actions webinar series. Today, we're going to be talking about laundry to landscape systems, how to design and install your own system. My name is Laura Allen, and I'm here with my colleague, Chris Arabia. Um, Hi, everybody. We actually we had a little, Chris was originally teaching this class, and I was going to be his technical support, but due to some unforeseen scheduling um, changes, we have switched roles. So I'm going to be teaching the Laundry the Landscape class on this webinar today, and Chris is going to be doing technical support. Before we get started, I have a few housekeeping notes. You can type in your questions and comments in the chat box on your left. We'll be taking some pauses throughout the presentation to answer questions in little groups. So we'll make sure to get your questions answered. You can also view the full screen by clicking on the upper right side of your slide if you'd prefer to view it in full screen mode. So before we get started on Laundry to Landscape, we at Greywater Action really encourage you to keep two guiding questions in mind as you design your system. The first is, how can you maximize water savings with your gray water system? We really want gray water to be replacing potable water irrigation. And also, how can you increase the ecological productivity of your landscape? So when you're thinking about what you're going to be irrigating, think about things that could maybe attract beneficial birds and insects. Maybe it could grow food for you and your family. Maybe it could shade your home or increase the beauty of your neighborhood. And I also want to note that there are many, many other kinds of gray water systems besides the laundry to landscape. We abbreviate it L to L. That means laundry to landscape. And all these other kinds of systems, they do require permits. They can be very simple and gravity-based. They can also incorporate pumps. And if they have proper filtration, you can use gray water compatible drip irrigation tubing. So there's many different kinds. Those other kinds of systems we're not going to be discussing today, but we will be talking about all of them further on in our series this year as well as um, our 2016 webinar series. When you're using gray water, whatever you're putting into the water is now going into your landscape. And so it's important that you use soaps and products that are healthy for your plants. There's a couple of things you need to avoid. The first one is salt. Sodium compounds are damaging to soils and plants. They're found in powdered laundry detergents and other products. And the sodium-based water softened water is also high in salt. So you want to avoid that. Boron is a microtoxin. So you want to avoid boron compounds. It's also called borate when it's in some detergent. And chlorine bleach. You can use hydrogen peroxide bleach if you would like. It's fine for the plants. Or you could just shut off your system if you're going to be using any of those um, compounds. This is a short list of products that are very low to have no salts and they're boron free. They're always going to be a liquid laundry detergent. Oasis is a brand made specially for gray water. Ecos is a brand that's pretty easy to find. Even Costco carries it. Trader Joe's has a suitable detergent. There's Biopack, Vasca, Pure Detergent, and there's more. And also if you use the soap alternatives like the Wonder Balls or Soap Nuts, those are also gray water safe. Um, before we get started in laundry to landscape system, I want to talk about just two vocabulary words so we have a shared understanding of this terminology. The first one is mulch. And mulch in our context are pieces of wood chips or other organic material like straw. And we use the mulch as a filter. It's an in-ground filter that naturally catches the lint and particles in the gray water as gray water is soaking through the ground. And we put the mulch in what we call a mulch basin. This is a shallow basin. It's dug near the plant you want to irrigate. And this is the location we're going to discharge gray water. So it'll go into the mulch. The mulch will catch the particles in the water, and the gray water can soak into the ground and into the soil to irrigate the roots. The mulch basin also acts like a sponge. It can soak up a lot of water at a time and then slowly release it into the landscape. And that picture is showing a man filling up a basin with wood chips. So this is our system today, Laundry to Landscape, or L to L. It was first invented by Art Ludwig of Oasis Design. This is a washing machine only system. It doesn't alter your household plumbing, and it doesn't require a permit in California as well as some other states if you're following basic guidelines. This is for a one or two family home. So as you can see in the picture, there's a washing machine. The washing machine has a pump in it, and normally it pumps out that water to the sewer or septic. With the Longino landscape system, we insert a diverter valve in 
directly connected to the discharge hose of the machine and send one side of the valve back to the sewer or septic. So when the handle is oriented in one position, the water is flowing back as it did before. Nothing has changed about the home. The other side of the valve, now this is our gray water irrigation system that we install. It's a series of pipes and tubing that directs that washed water as it's being pumped out to go into the landscape. So it's very simple. The sophistication of the system is in the design, making a thoughtful calculation so you're maximizing the amount of water you're producing each week in your laundry to match the needs of your plants outside. You can see that blue line, how the water is directly connected from the washer going out into the landscape. The materials for the system cost around $150 to $250. So if you can install it yourself, that's the full cost you'll see. If you purchase plants and mulch and uh, compost, things like that, that can definitely increase the cost. The numbers I just gave you are for the pipes and the fittings. If you hire someone, it's usually about a one to two day installation job. So it ranges from maybe $800 on the low end up to $2,000, maybe $2,500 on the high end, depending on the size of your system and who you hire. So here's some what it looks like in the home in one system. You see the washing machine, it has that black drain hose, it's connecting to the valves. On the left side is the loose fitting connection to the sewer. It's just sticking right into that scan pipe that's behind the machine. On the right side, there's a little black piece that's an anti-siphon vent that lets air go into the system, and then that pipe is going out into the landscape. In this image, the home has a crawl space, so the pipe is going through the floor and out into the landscape. You do need a way to get out into the landscape. So the previous picture showed going right out the wall. That home had an exterior wall. This one has a crawl space. So when you're thinking about your home, think about how you can get a pipe from your washing machine outside. Before you start installing the system, I encourage you to check out your pump filter. If you have a front-loading machine, it most likely has a filter on the pump, and that catches all the lint and debris, and uh, not lint, the de bigger debris that can't pass through it, like the coins and little pieces of gum wrappers or whatever gets into the wash through people's pockets. And that's often the cause of machines not being able to pump out all, your wa all the water and having problems finishing their cycle. So before you install the gray water system, it's a good idea to check on your pump filter if you have a front-loading machine and just make sure it's all cleaned out before you put in your system. And it's also just a good thing to know about in case you ever do have problems with um, the machine not evacuating the water. First thing to do is check that pump filter. You're going to use different fittings to connect from that valve. It's a one-inch brass three-way diverter valve and you'll need some different adapters to go from your washer hose and then from the PVC pipe. We're going to give you the last slide a resource section where you can get more detailed instructions that will have all the names again. So you, I'm not going to go part by part through the system, but you'll have all the resources so you can get that information when you're ready to build your system. You'll be using Teflon tape. Anytime there's a threaded fitting, you have to use the Teflon tape to prevent any leaks. You wrap it clockwise around the thread several times, and then be careful you're not cross-threading when you're screwing the fittings into the valve. The valve is metal and the fittings are plastic, and if you don't have them lined up properly, you can flatten that plastic thread and get a leak. So just be careful as you start out. And then when you get it installed, you'll be tightening with channel locks to get it nice and tight. There's some configurations of the valves. The valve must be above the flood rim of the machine. That's the top of the washer. And the washer hose must connect to the middle port. The ports are the inlet and the outlet. And in this valve, the middle one is always the inlet. So the washer is always going to go into that middle port. The picture on the left, you can see the left side is going into the sewer, the standpipe. And on the right side, it's going down into the gray water system. The image on the right is, is the opposite. The right side of the valve is going into that wash basin, which is their sewer connection, and the left side is going out into the landscape. And here's another option. The valve is turned on its side, which is totally fine to do, and the washer in this situation is going right into the middle of the valve, but the valve is turned on its side. You could even turn the valve upside down if you prefer to do that. You can turn it any way you want. You just have to come into the middle port. Here is an example of using a second washer hose for the sewer connection. 
sometimes the the plumbing from the valve to the sewer connection can be a little tight and a little tricky, and it's convenient to get a flexible hose and just be able to stick it back into that sewer connection like it was before. You can purchase a second washing machine hose, or you can purchase one-inch flexible um, drain hose, which some irrigation stores carry. Here's a PVC-free version. If you want to avoid using PVC as a product, you can purchase uh, these, all these materials and install the system using, it's called Blue Lock, which is made of a high-density polyethylene type of plastic. And there's a picture of an installation with that. And I want to spend a minute to talk about connecting the washer hose to the valve. This can be sometimes a tricky connection. The first thing to do is make sure you have the right size adapter. Some washer machine hoses have a one inch inner diameter and sometimes they are three quarter inch. Some of the very new extremely efficient machines have a three quarter inch diameter and generally speaking the more common diameter is one inch. Very, very rarely an old, old machine may have an inch and a quarter diameter. So make sure you get the right adapter. And then the second thing is if you have a washer hose that's very rigid and hard plastic, it might be hard to push it over the barbed fitting of the adapter, so you might want to stick it in some hot water. That'll soften the plastic and make it easier to get on. And then you'll secure it with hose clamps to make sure there aren't any leaks. If you do have any leaks, um, you can add a second hose clamp, make sure things are really tight, and then the kind of last resort if you're having trouble making that connection is you can get a little piece of vinyl tubing, which is a very soft plastic, and make a bridge. So you'll just connect between those two parts and clamp them together. And that usually addresses any potential leaks that may happen. So you'll be needing to take your pipe outside, and there will need to be a hole in your wall or floor. And this is the most complicated and difficult part of the whole system because in most homes, the walls are not empty inside. There are pipes, vents, water lines, gas lines, things that if you drilled into them, that could be a big problem. So we encourage people to, if you're not comfortable drilling through your house or haven't done this before, this is a great time to either hire somebody who has that experience or get a friend or somebody to come over that has that experience and do this part with you. Because this is really the only part where you could do some damage to your home. Anything else in the whole installation can be easily changed, just snipped apart and redone, so kind of like tinker toys, except for drilling through the house. So you're going to make sure you look for any potential issues. You drill with a pilot hole, which is a long, a long thin bit that will go all the way through the wall so you can see and feel for obstructions. And then if you're sure it's a good spot, you'll drill with a, an inch and a half hole saw to put that one inch pipe through the wall, making sure you're using the proper bit for your wall or floor. There's a piece in the system, we call it the anti-siphon component. It's called an auto vent or an inline vent, and it's that little black thing. Basically, it just lets air come into the system, and it doesn't let anything come out. And its function is to prevent a siphon from forming and sucking the water out of the machine when it tries to refill. So you want to put one in there to prevent that potential issue. There's a couple of parts you'll need to get that piece to connect into the rest of your system. And once you have it connected, you can place it either inside or outside in a climate that doesn't have heavy freezing. If you're in a heavy freeze area, you might need to place it inside or find a valve that can handle a freeze. But I'm speaking from California, where Southern California, where we don't get those heavy freezes, it's definitely fine to put it outside in our climate. And it does need to be at the high point of the system, which means before the pipe drops down, you need to put this anti-siphon component. And once, so it may be in your house if you're going, it will definitely be in your house if you're going through the floor. If you're going out through the wall, it could either be inside or outside. And the valve must be accessible in case of leaks. It shouldn't leak, but if it ever failed or if it came defected from the manufacturer, water may come out of it and you would need to replace it. So you don't want to put it inside a wall where you can't see that happening. Uh, you're going to be plumbing from the valve to the hole to the outside using PVC. You can cut PVC pipe with pipe cutters or a handsaw, and you'll be trying to minimize fittings just to get the water to flow as smoothly as possible. And then you'll be gluing it. Um, you can. This picture up there is a brand that I, I like because it's very low in 
smell. It doesn't smell as bad as other PVC cements. It's called Gorilla PVC cement, and there's, you can really use any type of PVC glue. You want to make sure your pipes are clean and dry. You're applying your glue to the inside of the hub and then the outside of the pipe and pushing them and holding them together to make sure you get a good joint. You'll be strapping your valve and or your pipe. That handle, it makes some, there has some torque to it when you turn the handle up or down to control the flow of water. So you want to have securely strapped that to the wall. If you know where the studs are in your wall, you could screw it right into the wall, but many times it's a lot easier to just mount a piece of wood on the wall and then have a lot more flexibility in where you attach that valve. We're going to label everything. If you have long runs of above ground gray water pipes, you need to label it caution, non-potable gray water, do not drink. That's a code requirement in California. You always want to label your diverter valve so people know how it works. The valves themselves have a little arrow on them, but they're not intuitive at all. So you want to post a sign that says how to turn the handle and how to control the flow. Sometimes the best way is just to take a photograph of your valve in both orientations and then label that so you can see your valve and how it, it actually works itself to turn that handle and redirect the flow of water. Here's an example of a stacked washer in a closet. So sometimes there's really not a lot of space. So sometimes you can fit the valves on the side of the wall. Sometimes you have to get even more creative with your installation. And here's some atypical valve installations due to different site constraints. If you go home and they're looking at your laundry room and thinking about how this will apply to your situation and it doesn't look as, like it did in my previous examples, that's okay. There's lots of considerations and sometimes what's what works in your situation may not look like other pictures you've seen. You just need to follow the principles that I mentioned before. And you can even have a very high-end, um, very clean installation if you do a little more work. This valve is inside the wall, so the sheetrock was cut out, the pipes were installed, and the, there was cabinetry made to match the existing cabinetry with a little door. So you could make this look very nice and blend into your home's aesthetic with a little extra effort. Now we're going to move into some of the design work with your knowing how much water you have, and then we'll talk about how many plants you can water. So the first thing we need to do with this system is to estimate how much gray water is being produced on a weekly basis. So number one, you want to know how many loads of laundry are done each week in your house. Ask the person that does the laundry. They may have a different answer than the person who does not do the laundry but also shares the home. So try to get that number as accurate as you can. Then number two, how many gallons per load? I encourage you to try to get a little more specific here than these general numbers I'm going to give you if you can. But if you can't, just go with these numbers. If you have a top loading machine, the old fashioned ones, with, they're all, um, they have the agitator inside, that uses about 40 gallons a load. If you have a front loading machine, that uses about 15 gallons a load. If you have a top efficient machine, those are the newer versions of the top loaders. They don't have an agitator. It's empty inside. Those use around 25 gallons a load. And then you want to think about future changes. Are you going to purchase a new machine? Is your usage going to either go up or down? And try to make the best estimate for your foreseeable future. We have a little formula. You multiply the loads per week times the gallons per load, and that equals your gallons per week of gray water. In the example on the slide, four loads per week, this is a, front, uh, this is a 25 gallon per load machine. Multiply those two numbers and you get 100 gallons per week of gray water. When we do these classes with, in a group of people, we have ranges from 30 gallons per week to up to 300 gallons per week. So this number can really vary depending on your type of machine and the usage that happens in your home. So you want to get really specific to your house here because that's your irrigation. So now we're going to talk about plants. Oh, and let's take a pause. Does anybody have any questions so far? Okay, so we're going to talk about plants. And the really great options for irrigating with a laundry to landscape gray water system are trees. Fruit trees are nice if you like to eat fruit, shrubs, bushes perennials and large annuals. 
So you think about the size of a tomato plant and larger, those are all really easy to irrigate with this kind of system. You can water food crops as long as the gray water is not touching the edible portion of the food. So that means root vegetables are not allowed, but any food where the food's above the ground, like tomatoes or beans or fruit, fruit cheese, are totally fine. The not as good options are the lawns. A lawn is not one plant, it's hundreds to thousands of plants, and you can't distribute the water below ground to all of those little individual plants with this system. So lawns are not possible with a launch to landscape system. Not as good are drought established plants. So that means a plant that maybe is in your landscape that's old, it's never been watered, and it's happy and healthy, it would not be a good plant to start watering regularly. Um, potted plants, not suitable. If you have sensitive plants or any plants you're having problems with, maybe not suitable, though maybe gray water would help them. And then the root crops are not allowed by code. Raised beds, it depends on the situation. So I will show you how to do raised beds, but they're kind of less ideal than plants in the ground. Any type of fruit tree is great for gray water. Lemon trees, apple trees, any tree. So looking at, let's pretend this is your yard. You have a lawn, you have trees. Thinking about a longitudinal landscape to match the irrigation of this yard, what would you water? You would go for the trees, the bushes, the shrubs. Uh, maybe you consider lawn removal or shortening the lawn, shrinking the size of the lawn. You could basically water anything in this yard except the lawn. I'm going to take a minute to talk about plant water requirements. And this is how much should you be watering your plants. Some people have absolutely no idea. Others have a lot of an idea. So I'm going to give you um, just a gen some general information that can help you if you're someone that doesn't have those numbers or those ways to calculate it re readily at hand. So you want to think about, since we have people in this webinar from different states, I'm going to kind of broaden this to cool, warm, and hot climates. So think about if you live in a cool, warm, or a hot place. Cool. We'll say like San Francisco, foggy summers, much lower water need than other places. Uh, warm, Oakland, Los Angeles type climate. It's warm in the summer. It's not um, as hot as the next category, which is hot Imperial Valley area, like most days in the summer are over 100. So think about if you live in a cool, warm, or hot place. And then I'm going to give you a number to go with your climate. And this is for the weekly irrigation needs during the peak season, this is the summer, per square foot of planted area. So the size of your plant is going to affect how much to water it. So in a cool climate like San Francisco, it's a quarter gallon per square foot of planted area. In a warm climate like Oakland, Los Angeles, half a gallon and hot would be one gallon. So when I say per square foot of planted area, per square foot means like how big is the plant. If you can see that little raspberry patch, it's a one foot by eight foot planter bed. One times eight is eight square feet. And just to note that if you're watering low water use plants, you would do the same estimate and then you would cut your number in half because they need a lot less. So I'll do an example. So here's that little raspberry bed, the eight square foot bed. If you were in San Francisco, during the summer you'd water that little bed two gallons per week. If you were in Los Angeles, you'd water it four gallons per week. If you were in the Imperial Valley, you would water it eight gallons per week. And so I'm going to leave it at that, and then at the end, you will have more resources if you want to go back and learn a little more about how you can calculate the area of your plants and do a little more practice or get more resources for finding how much to water the plants in your yard. And I also want to take this time to note that improperly designed gray water systems won't save water. And when I say improperly designed, the pipes and the fittings and everything can be installed perfectly and it can all look great and function really well, but the choices about where to plant what and what to irrigate is the problem in this example. The water save, if you want to save water, you have to have a proper design. So in this picture, this was taken in Southern California, there's a bright green lawn, so you know they were sprinkling that green lawn to keep it green. And they planted fruit trees, young fruit trees, right in the middle of the lawn, and then sent their laundry water to water their fruit trees. The system works fine. 
there's no technical problems with it, but the problem is they aren't able to save any water with the system because they, if they want to have a green lawn, which they they do because it's still green, they have to keep sprinkling the water. So they're, what they're really doing is just adding extra water into the area. If this was your yard, let's say you wanted some new fruit trees, you wanted a gray water system, you wanted some lawn, and you wanted to save water, one change you could make is you could take those trees out of the middle of the lawn and you could put them maybe to the side of the lawn or group them together in a portion of the lawn and underneath those fruit trees don't have the lawn. Have wood chips or some other type of landscape that doesn't require irrigation and then those fruit trees will be watered by your gray water system. The amount of water it takes to water your lawn is going to be reduced because the size of the lawn is smaller. And I'll touch again on why lawns aren't suitable for this type of system. Um, the laundry to landscape is going to be sending water out through that tube to specific plants. And per California code and per most codes in the West, you need to be irrigating subsurface. And so to water a lawn with gray water, you would have to first remove the lawn, then put in subsurface irrigation, drip irrigation, to be able to spread the water out all over that area and then put the lawn back. And then to send gray water through a subsurface drip irrigation system, you're going to have to have really good filtration to prevent clogging. So you can't use this particular kind of system we're talking about today. You'd have to have a more um, a system that incorporated filters and, and cleaning out of those filters. So that's why lawns are out. You can't sprinkle gray water through the sprinkler system. That's not allowed. It would also clog up the sprinklers, um, this type of system. So lawns are logistically not possible with this kind of gray water system. So um, next I'm going to talk about a limitation of this kind of gray water system, and that is the number of outlets you can have. If you'll kind of back up for a second and think about a drip irrigation system, if you want to water a plant, you just add in more emitters. You don't really have your limit. You're not very limited in how many outlets or plants you can reach in a, in a typical backyard for the most part. With a gray water system, the amount of water we have is coming out of our washing machine. So each time the machine is pushing out the water, there's a limited amount of water. And if you try to spread that limited amount of water out over too big of an area, you're not going to get water coming out all of the outlets. So these numbers I'm going to give you, these are kind of the maximum you could do. If you try to do more, it's going to be really difficult. You can definitely do less and you can get even distribution. So if you have a top loading machine, you can have no more than 20 distribution points. If you have a top efficient machine, reduce that down to 10. You could think about that as like 10 trees or 10 plants if you want to. If you have a front loading machine, um, no more than eight distribution points. And if you have a, an ultra efficient machine, you may need to reduce that down to about four. Because each time that machine pumps out water, it's not very much. And so it gets hard to distribute it to a lot of different places. So that is a limitation that we need to work with as we decide where to direct this gray water. Now some other information. This is California Plumbing Code. I know not all of you are from California, but I encourage you to check out your code and see what setbacks are in place. And the setback is a distance that you need to be to keep the gray water away from certain things so you don't cause problems. And this is setbacks for irrigation fields in the California Plumbing Code. You can see two feet from buildings, a foot and a half from property lines, 100 feet from drinking water wells or creeks, five feet septic, four feet leach fields, and three feet above the groundwater table. So where you're going to direct the water to irrigate the plants, you need to be at least this far or farther away from these things. So you'll be sending the pipe to the landscape. You may have obstacles. You may have be coming from an upper story and have to go around decks or porches. You may have a hardscape. So you're basically just going to send your pipe to your yard, to the landscape part of your yard, trying to maintain a downward slope whenever possible. You don't always have to be going down because you have that machine pushing the water through it. But if you can go down with your pipe downward slope, you should because it's better. If you encounter a hardscape, you can go under it. You can dig holes on both sides and then make a passageway for your pipe. Sometimes you can go around it, reroute your, your design. 
sometimes you might decide to remove it or cut a strip out of it. You can see on the left there was a big driveway that had to be crossed so there was a big groove cut and then patched with cement. And in the lower image the same thing happens but it was patched with tile and then those upper images are going under a narrow pathway. Now we have some float considerations. So this irrigation system is directly connected to your washing machine. The washing machine has a pump, it's pushing the water out, but that pump is not made to just pump water any old place. We have to be very conservative and cautious and not overtaxing our pump. So some of these are some kind of generally safe numbers for you to work with. If you're in a flat yard and your washing machine is pushing the water through, so it's actually doing the work, pushing through, your distribution should be within 50 feet. 50 feet is, for most machines, um, not too much work for it to do. It's within the rating of the pump. Normally, they're rated to pump up, so instead of going up, we're going across. So we do some calculations and get this number 50 feet. If your site is sloping downwards, you can go as far as you want because gravity is doing the work of moving that water. Though sometimes the problem is the water goes too fast, you need to slow it down if you want to irrigate all the way down the slope. So you can serpentine, that's making your pipe, your tubing go in the shape of an S to slow the flow of water down. And then a safety thing you need to do is leave a one inch open end to protect the machine's pump. You can have this anywhere in your system, but just keep in mind you need a place for all the water to come out unrestricted somewhere. And this can be an irrigation point, it can be in a mulch basin, um, sometimes it can be what's called like a snorkel, it can come up in the air a little bit and be discreetly attached somewhere where usually water shouldn't come out of there unless there was a problem and think there was clogging down the line. So you want to have somewhere for all that water to come out to protect your washing machine. I'm going to show you a picture. So here's a house. It has a flat yard in the front. You can water that flat part within 50 feet. It has a downward sloping front yard. You can go as far down as you want, but you're going to be serpentining to slow the water, flow of the water down. And then it has an upward sloping side yard that would not be a suitable place to irrigate with this kind of gray water. You'll be trenching and installing the tubing. So this is one inch high density polyethylene tubing. It looks like a drip system, it's just a little bigger. And it is needs to be kind of out of the way, out of the sun, stake it down so it doesn't wiggle around if you want it to be buried or if you don't want it to move around. In this picture, you can see the black tubing is the one inch. It's got the open end of the line, kind of all the way to the front of the image, and that's an irrigation valve box. We'll talk more about that in a sec. You can see that mulch basin is in front of these young fruit trees, and the gray water is going to irrigate into that mulch basin. And just a note, if your yard has any elevation changes, like slight changes, maybe a very gradual upward part of the yard and then gradual downward part, you should run your line to the highest point that you're going to go and then come down. Otherwise, it's going to be really difficult to get the flow of water to come out evenly because the water would prefer to stay in the downward parts of the yard rather than the slight upward part. You're going to be cutting in these tees, these are called one by half inch reducing tees. So you see that little picture on the top left. That is what it looks like. It's called a barbed fitting. So the tubing pushes right over that fitting. If you push your tubing in some water, get it warm, it'll fit right over that fitting. And if you're using the high density polyethylene, you don't need to clamp it at all. It'll be on there really securely and it won't come undone. If you happen to use polyethylene tubing, which I'm not recommending, but some people do, you will need to hose clamp it because that tubing will, will pull off. It's not doesn't make as strong as an attachment there. If a couple of tips with the tubing. If there's ever any kinks in your tubing or damaged places, you must cut them out. You don't want any restrictions or any places where the water can't pass through because that would be putting back pressure on your machine. Another note about the hot water, if you're, when you're installing this, you, bringing the thermos of hot water will make your life so much easier than if you try to just muscle it on there. And a note about the half inch tubing. So if you see in that picture, there's a smaller part of tubing coming out into the basin lying on top of the ground. That's half inch tubing. And you use that to direct water to the specific irrigation places, to the plants, to the mulch basins. These are your outlets. 
And you want to minimize that tubing since it is smaller. It's easier to send to kind of re to direct your main one inch line close to the basins and then just have short sections of that half inch. If you have really, really long half inch lines, the water will prefer to stay in the main line and won't come out it so easily. So here's some pictures of the mulch basins. Your basins are going to be in what's called the drip line of your plant. So let's say you're going to water a tree. The best place to irrigate it is at the edge of the branches. That's called the drip line. And the roots of the plant go, they are, the cedar roots are in that drip line and they go well beyond it. So if you're in the drip line, that's in a good place to irrigate. Where you don't want to be is too close to the base of the plant. If you're putting water against the trunk or the base of the plant, you can cause problems for the plant. So look for the drip line of your plants, and that's where you're going to be putting these basins. Your basins could be a circle. They could be a trench in front of a row of plants. You can see in this picture the tree has a circle around it. The bushes that are planted against the house, there's a trench going in front of that, and that's a trench-shaped basin. If you have a, a sub, several smaller plants clustered together, you can make your basins different shapes, like a star or you know, really any shape you want to spread that water out. It'll be spreading through the bottom of your basin. So here's a picture of a basin. And you can see how water is spreading through the bottom of the basin. Um, the important part of the basins are they are big enough that whatever gray water you put into that basin can soak into the ground or soak into the mulch without ever being visible. You don't ever want to have puddles of water. It's called ponding. You don't want ponding. You don't want runoff. The, the basin should be big enough to accommodate whatever flow you're directing into it. And you can see in that picture how the water can flow along the bottom of the basin. This is a construction picture, so when it's finished, all that will be filled up with the wood chips. Basically, if you have clay soils, your basins are going to need to be larger to accommodate the same amount of water it, as opposed to some kind of sandy or loamy type soil because clay is slower draining. And the great thing about the system is if you happen to make your basins too small, you see gray water, all you do is make the basin bigger, just enlarge it. It's a really easy thing to fix. And I want to have a, one point of clarification. When we were talking about how many plants we can water, we were talking about how much gray water is produced on a weekly basis. The weekly number is your irrigation potential. How many loads of laundry do you do per week is producing your irrigation water for that week. Now I'm talking about how big to make your basins. You want to think about in your house, what's your daily maximum flow? If you're the kind of person that does all of your laundry on the same day, your basins are going to need to be bigger to soak up all that water than your neighbor who might spread out their laundry throughout the week. So you'll need to think about what are your laundry patterns and how that's going to affect how big to make your basin. And again, if you make them too small, you just have to make them bigger. It's not a big deal. So in the resources, I'll give you more if you want to get into the sizing, if you're the kind of person that really wants to know for sure how big to make the basins you will have that information to go to. But just generally speaking, if you have clay soils, which are slower draining, you need about a square foot per gallon. So if you were going to direct six gallons to a tree on any given day, you would need about six square feet of basin. This is the footprint of the basin. So from that previous picture, the wet part was the bottom of the basin. If you were in a sandy clay soil, that would be about a half a square foot per gallon. So sending the same six six gallons to a tree in a different yard would only need three square feet of basin to soak up that water or to soak down that water. So then the kind of one of the last parts of the system is what we call a mulch shield. And this is preventing roots from growing back into our gray water system and clogging it up. We're directing water to subsurface to the area around the roots of our plants. And they are going to want to get the water. And if they can, they'll grow right up the pipe and try to get the water first, and that will clog your whole system up. So to prevent that from happening, you need to make a space, an air space around the outlet so the roots can't grow up into it. 
and we call that a mulch shield. It's shielding the outlet or an outlet shield. It's shielding it from the mulch, which is where roots can get to. So if you look at this diagram, there is a one by half inch T. That's where you peed off the main line, and there's a half inch tubing coming into the middle of the basin, and it's protected by um, a container that there's little you drill a little hole, so it's coming into the middle, and water flows through that open air, and then it soaks into the mulch. And if you look on the right, this you can see there's the green is the one inch line, the gray, you can see that gray, there's a little gray T is where you're teeing off, and that white cap is covering up. That's the code requirement. It has to be covered by two inches or subsurface by two inches, creating that airspace, and then the gray water is soaking down into the mulch. I'll show a few more pictures. So here is mulch shields using irrigation valve boxes. These are, you can purchase them at any irrigation store, Home Depot, those kind of stores. They have a green lid that comes off. The bottom is totally open, so the water flows through. And all you have to do is drill a hole closer to the top so your pipe comes in. It's sitting in the hole you just drilled, and the water's flowing through the air into the mulch. The irrigation valve boxes are really strong and sturdy and great, though they're a little pricey, especially if you have a lot of them. And so a more economical alternative is to use a piece of drain pipe, four inch or six inch, you know, of kind of wide pipe, and you cut it down to the size you want. It doesn't have a top, so you're gonna have to make your own cap. You can purchase a cap or make your own cover, but you're basically doing the same thing. You're creating this airspace. So if you see that picture on the left, there's the main one inch line, there's a half inch line coming into that piece of drain pipe. There's a hole drilled in the top. The tubing is stuck into it so the gray water can flow through the air and then it will eventually hit the mulch. There is no mulch yet in that picture, but that's where it's going to be. Picture on the right, you can see a couple of them. It's going to be a mulch filled trench. And then that lower picture, there are covers on all of them. So once it's done, you really can't see much. It's all below ground and covered up, but you can access it and that in get to the place where you're preventing the potential clogging. So raised beds, I did mention before that they're not ideal, but if you have, if you only have raised beds, you don't have any plants in the ground, you can usually irrigate them with a longitudinal landscape system. You want to be a little mindful of how far away are they, is your washing machine elevated or is it on the, at grade? Um, if you have a machine like on a second story or up on a porch or some high up place that's several feet above, there's plenty of push to get the water out across your yard and then up into that raised bed. But you do want to think a little bit more about if you're overtaxing your machine or not, depending on where your raised bed is compared to your washing machine. So in this picture, you can see the pipe is coming up. You'll need some 90 then to get up into that bed, making sure there's no damage to the pipe as you're entering the bed and then so run your main line in the middle of the bed. You can have little mulch basins on the sides, little peas and little short sections of half inch and spread the water out into the raised bed that way. So after you have your system done, you're going to test and tune it. So tuning is making sure that the water's coming out evenly in all of the outlets that you have created. There's two ways to do it. The picture on the left, you're just connecting the pipe from the inside to the tubing on the outside, there's a one fitting you need, you push them together, your system's all connected, you run your machine, you probably have to run it twice, because the first time you run it, the water will be filling the pipe and wetting the pipe and kind of moving around. The second time, you can really see how the water's flowing. So run your machine twice, go out there and make your adjustments. An alternative is to put in a union, which is a fitting that you can open up, or some kind of place where you can disconnect your system and then connect a garden hose to it. So you can run garden hose water while the system is totally separated from your washing machine. And then you can make your adjustments a little more leisurely. As you're balancing the flows, there's two things you can do. The first one is you're going to check on all of the outlets you've made. You put in these T's and you might have these little sections of half inch. You want to make sure that the angle is appropriate. So if you have a outlet that doesn't have any water and the T is pointing up into the air, you just rotate the T down. And that can often, just by rotating the T's to make those 
physical adjustments to your system, you can often get a much better balance throughout your system. The second thing you can do is add these, these are called full port ball valves. So it's a little ball valve, but inside of it, it doesn't have a restriction. So you really want to make sure you're using this specific kind of ball valve, otherwise you'll get a clog there really quick. So use the right kind of ball valve, and you can turn it down slightly, and you're going to slightly be restricting the flow. So maybe there's one, the first outlet in your system is getting way too much water, and the last one's not getting anything. If you put a ball valve on the first one and you turn it down a little bit, that will restrict the flow there and encourage the water to continue on into the system so you can balance the flows by using these strategically. You want to avoid clogs. Gray water has material in it, part particles, lint, hair, all that stuff. And you want to avoid clogs. We want that all that matter to get out into the wood chips and just decompose. So these are the things to do to avoid clogs. You want to minimize how many of those ball valves you use. Some people think, oh, I'll just put them on every single outlet, and then I can go and adjust them as needed. And it kind of sounds like a good idea, but actually it's just asking for problems, because every time you put one on, that's a clogging potential. And if somebody were to inadvertently turn them all off, then your system is really not going to be working as designed, and it will cause, cause problems. So I encourage you to only use them maybe one or two, maybe three, and it depends on your system, but you should not use them on every outlet. Then the second thing, make sure you're using the full port ball valves. If you go to a store and just buy any old ball valve, you will get a clog right away. And remember that open outlet is best. And also remember if you're using valves to check for clogs as you do your annual maintenance. So there's some follow-up to do. You're going to bury any tubing that needs to be buried. Check for leaks. Paint pipe, off the holes, post your signs. There's a maintenance manual that comes with these systems. We can give you an example of that. They're also in the resources we're going to give you. Get your gray water friendly soaps and do your laundry. And you water your plants. I have the code summary. This is California code. I'm not going to really go over it, but you will have this as a resource. These are the things you have to do to be in, co in compliance with the code. You can find it in Chapter 16 of the California Plumbing Code. And you can download that from our website. And then there's the don'ts. And they're all things that we've pretty much already talked about. They're very easy to comply with. The system, you can build it well, comply with the code, and you don't need a permit, and it's legal. It's a really great system. If you have a home that produces a lot of water, there are ways to spread the water out more. This is sort of an optional thing, only in the right situation. You can put in a second three-way valve, so you can have different zones. You can also have some valves that can shut off a line as needed. But always keeping in mind that no matter what somebody comes along and does with your valves, you want to make sure that the water can always exit somewhere, a place where there's a full one-inch line is your emergency outlet. So never make a system where people can shut off all the valves and, and totally block the flow, because that could damage your machine. So as you go to design your system, you want to think about what plants will you irrigate. So go back to the gallons per week you have of gray water in your home, how much your plants want to be watered, and you'll try to do a really good match. The numbers I gave you before, that was peak irrigation need, that's like July. You don't need to water that much all year long, but you can get a sense of can you meet the peak requirements. If you're a little bit under, that's probably fine. You can always observe them for signs of water stress. If you're way over, then you know you have more water, and you could probably spread it out to more plants or maybe plant some new things that you've been wanting to grow. And so make those choices of how to do a good match trying to save as much water as you can. And for people that have an existing irrigation system, you should try really hard to find a whole zone you can shut off. If you can find a zone, maybe one of your trees, maybe there's a zone of trees, if you can replace all of those trees, their irrigation with your gray water, then you can turn that whole zone off and you'll get really good water saving. Sometimes you can't and then you'll have to go out and like cap off specific um, irrigation points in your irrigation system, but if you have the zones and can shut it off, go for that option. There is annual maintenance of these systems. The laundry to landscape is very low maintenance, but like anything, it does need to be checked on. 
about once a year. When you first install your system, you will want to check on it more frequently to make sure that the flow is flowing properly. I'd say check it every time you do laundry for maybe two or three times. And if you're still satisfied with how the water is flowing, everything looks good, your basins were sized appropriately, you don't have pooling or runoff, then you can basically not check on it again for a year. If you have extremely high flows, that, may, that time may need to be increased. But basically once a year for most people. And the once a year maintenance, you'll visually inspect valves. That will be kind of as you do laundry, things in the laundry machine. You'll go outside and you'll check the basins. You want to see the gray water outlet four to six, you know, about a four inch drop air space between the gray water where it's coming out and the wood chips, and then you'll want to see wood chips. If you open up your outlet and you look in and you see soil or you see roots or, um, or the level is all the way up to your gray water outlet, that means that you need to do some maintenance. You put on your gloves, you get the trowel out, maybe a shovel, but usually just a trowel, and you remove the decomposed mulch, the soil, and you put in some fresh wood chips. So it's pretty minimal, but it does need to be done for sure. And if you have any of those valves in your landscape, you need to check those valves. You should open them, run the system, let any potential buildup behind them come out. And that is your annual maintenance. I'm going to end with resources, and then we'll go back to the questions. Graywateraction.org, I'm sure you've all been on our website because you're on our webinar. But I want to point to some resources that we have specifically on our website that can help you as you go to design and build your system. There is a manual that you can download for free. It's called the San Francisco Graywater Design Guidelines for Outdoor Irrigation. You can download it on the link you see above on the slide, or you can we have a download link on our website as well. And that has step-by-step -step instructions, basically what I went over today, but more in detail because it's a whole manual. The thing to note is the irrigation calculations there are for San Francisco. So depending on where you live, you'll most likely need to increase the irrigation. So be keep that in mind as you read over that manual. Then uh, The Waterwise Home, that's a book I wrote last year, and a lot of the images I showed in the slideshow were from that book. It's a how-to book, so it has even more details about how to design and install this particular type of system, as well as other kinds, as well as rainwater and waterless toilets. And then there's a great video, it's Ask the Sold House. It shows a laundry landscape system getting built, so it's a really great thing. It's only about six or so minutes long, and you, maybe eight minutes, and you get to see the construction part to get a sense of, like, can I do this? Do I need to get help? How is, how is this actually going to feel to build it? If you can get a lot more of an idea by seeing a video of that. The title is Gray Water Small Engine. If you're looking for parts and you can't find them locally, you can order them online. There's a kit, a laundry to landscape kit from Clean Water Components. There's also a DVD from oasisdesign.net. And lastly, we have a forum. So it's a question and answer forum. You can ask any questions that come up, and we can help you with that. So um, we'll do questions from the that came up earlier on. And if anybody has more questions, please type them in now. I see a question about a wicking raised bed. Um, you could. You can definitely adapt gray water as an irrigation source to other types of irrigation raised beds. Um, the mulch basins are kind of like they do move the water through, so in, in some sense that can help spread out the water. I'm not exactly sure what type of wicking raised bed you're referring to, but knowing the principles of gray water and how to distribute it, you can adapt it to other situations as well. Um. That's it for questions. OK. Yeah, and so anything that comes up, please go to our forum. We love for people to get those in the public eye because they can be useful to more people in the future. And just a note on our upcoming webinars, we have more of different types of gray water systems. This year, we're having a workshop or a webinar on the branch drain system, which is a gravity flow system coming from showers or sinks usually. And we'll have a focus on working in desert climates. We'll also have a webinar on irrigating fruit trees and backyard fruit orchards. In early 2016, the next series will, will bring in the other types of systems, the pump systems and the filter systems. So thanks. Um, thank you, everybody.
and we will see you next time. And maybe I'll stay on in case more questions come up. I'll be a little pause. So I'll say goodbye and um, see if any more questions come up. But thanks for attending, everybody. And thanks, Chris. Thanks, everybody.